All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, I apologize for such a brief break uh, before this, but I wanted to make sure this panel has its uh, full complement of time because we've got some really uh, important voices to hear from. This panel will be this, the topic here is when and how to involve law enforcement. It's a topic that's come up in nearly every conversation over the last two days. Um, and so we wanted to close with it here today. Uh, our facilitator is uh, an active member in our Prevention Practitioners Network committees, and that's Noel March. He's a lecturer, lecturer of Justice Studies and director of the Maine Community Policing Institute at the University of Maine at Augusta. He's joined by Dr. Carrie Gibson, our keynote speaker from yesterday. She's the unit chief of FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit 1. Then we have uh, Eric Shen. He's inspector in charge of the Criminal Investigations Group for the United States Postal Investigation Service, bringing the perspective of law enforcement in preventing workplace violence. Uh, and then finally, we have Chief Paul Dean. He's chief of police and associate vice president for public safety and risk management for the University of New Hampshire. Noel, over to you. Good, thanks very much, uh, uh, Brett, and, uh, and everyone for uh, sticking with us here into the final uh, portion of this two-day symposium. So as you know from your agenda, and as a, Brett has just said, when and how to engage law enforcement. Now, I've been listening in as well, and clearly uh, those who are in, in committed to and invested in the um, interventions, the prevention, response, the recovery work of threat assessment and preventing that uh, in, our, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities. What we all know is that the threat, the perceived threat, uh, the potential threat can come from anywhere. It can come from internal, external, employee, non-employee, student, non-student. It can come near or far. We just had a case here in Maine, where I'm speaking to you from Bangor, Maine, uh, where we where an arrest was made along with two others from other states that were focusing on house of worship violence and making plans in Chicago. And so again, it isn't necessarily always in our backyard. Quite often it isn't. But integrating law enforcement is the topic for this uh, this final section. And when do we as private company uh, representatives or community group representatives, when you think about um, how companies uh, such as you know, Microsoft and Amazon or Jewish community centers or houses of worship, uh, Planned Parenthood, our schools, there are 4,200 colleges and universities across the country, for example. And what I want to do is look to those who have had this experience whether it's higher ed, whether it's the US Postal Service, or those of us who have already been in this space and have something to share about how and when law enforcement needs to be engaged, involved, and at the table. So with, uh, with that in mind, I want to uh, uh, turn to, this will be a discussion. This is gonna be a facilitated dialogue uh, together. And, to talk on that, uh, that very subject, I'm gonna turn first to uh, my neighbor in New Hampshire, uh, police chief of the University of New Hampshire, Paul Dean, who is the president elect of the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators, as well as the role he has, not only as the chief of police for a uh, land grant division one uh, research university, public university here in this country, but also he's very experienced in uh, behavioral threat assessments, um, incident command, and working with mental health um, partners in a preventative posture. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about what you have learned and where law enforcement's role is and when that is in threat assessment? Thanks, Noel, and welcome uh, everybody. To, I'm calling from the state of New Hampshire. Um, I don't know if anybody's from New Hampshire, but uh, it's a nice drizzly day out here today. Um, so here's, here's, here's what I know. I know from my experience that you need to start with building relationships. 
And so if you look at the, if you look at colleges and universities and you look at college and university public safety, whether it's Swan or Run Swan, one of the things that we do and we do well is we build relationships with all of our constituents in the community. And for me, it's that relationship building that starts. And once it's started, it's something that has to be watered. It's not a one and done thing. And where you need to be for law enforcement is part of the behavioral intervention team, that network, not just someone who's called in when an emergency happens, but on the ground working with um, behavioral specialists, healthcare specialists, others in the community who have eyes on the pulse of the community as it relates to climate, um, mental health climate. At the University of New Hampshire, we average 80 to 100 students going to the mental health facility in Portsmouth, New Hampshire a year who want to hurt themselves. This has been a passion of mine. My brother committed suicide uh, and uh, every day I work towards trying to not let that happen to any other family there. But law enforcement's place is at the beginning, not at the end. And the work's got to be done to make that happen, Noel. And when, at what point, if you have in your area of responsibility um, a, a group or individuals who are working towards intervention, at what point do you as a police leader introduce yourself and insert yourself into that group if you have not yet been invited? I mean, what are the steps that those who are tuned in here and listening can take? We talk about communication, building relationships, and of course, that's based on building trust. What advice or thoughts do you have on that, Paul? It's never too late to start that. And I realize um, my just started my 38th year in law enforcement that we are in some difficult times in terms of our trust and relationships across the country with, with law enforcement in the community. That shouldn't stop us from going and sitting down and showing who we are. Uh, law enforcement has many roles. Most people think law enforcement is simply the enforcement role. And I would say that that is actually probably the smallest percent of what we do. Um, I think our biggest role, and I think you saw it in the last two years, is our community caretaking responsibility. You know, we, we, we are there to serve the public. We're there to help the, the public. And so it, it going and meeting with your local mental health professionals, asking where the behavioral intervention teams are, um, those kind of efforts to get in there and bring with you what you can bring to the table. Law enforcement has a global look at what's going on in their, in their area of influence, whether it be a campus, a city, a town, state, federal government, you have an area of influence. You have a global look from many perspectives. In fact, a lot of things that happen it, it run through law enforcement like a central terminal. And so you're able to take a look back when there's somebody who gets on the spectrum of concern as to whether or not law enforcement's been to their home before, um, maybe whether or not they own a firearm, um, other kind of contacts that only law enforcement would have. And you can help in that evaluation of threat. And, and, and just and, to, and provide the, the professional, the professional is gonna sit with them, some, some good information to help that assessment. I think we bring a key piece that's, that's missing in a lot of places. I believe many of the um, viewers will, will agree these truths should hold self-evidence that we do need police as full-on partners, but not everyone does. One of the, an old an old saying that uh, I was taught when I first entered this profession was the police are the first ones you look for and the last ones you want to meet. And it's interesting for those of us in carry. I'm going to turn it over to you in just a second here because the police carry a heavy burden of identity. This perception is reality, particularly these past two years, where 
from a public standpoint, there's been a, um, a stepping back and a pushing away and an increase in maybe suspicion or concern around credibility of having police involved because things will get uh, blown out of proportion or something bad will occur if the police are part of the solution. And certainly the FBI has, a, uh, uh, over the decades, I mean, has had almost a mystique, an aura of, you know, a big brother. And, um, and we know there's some truth. We know there's a lot of that is not true about that. And as resources, we are important helpers. We know this. How do we overcome a, um, and a, um, and anyone who would be adverse to working with or, or collaborating with law enforcement. I, I, and I'll, I'll say for the viewers, these questions were not fed to any of our panelists ahead of time. So every one of them is getting it for the first time. Carrie, do you have any, uh, can you unmute, have any thoughts on uh, how, um, how, do you, how do you integrate in with trust and partnership? You know, I think it's it's huge what uh, Chief Dean said about building those relationships ahead of time, right? So you're always first getting out there and letting people see who you are and hear who you are and hear what your mission is, which is probably a little bit different than what they see on TV or what they assume to be, right? And so the number one first part is to be able to really educate them and let them see you're a real person. The other thing is when we have key cases that come in where we're going to be doing threat assessment, threat management, I want the right people talking to the families and into the to the people that we're concerned about. Um, and you know, we have that ability to pick the right people to go out and have that contact contact with them because I want it to be genuine. I want people to realize that that we are impacted by targeted violence like everybody else. And part of our mission is to prevent it from happening. And we are more dynamic than just arresting people. Um, and so I think that that's really the first part of it um, to really consider. And from my, my background, you know, I'm, I've obviously been an FBI agent for 15 years, but I'm also a licensed clinical psychologist. And wearing both those hats really helped me to help educate my fellow law enforcement officers on things that we need to consider and how we go about talking to someone, right? And then lastly, I think really we need to empathize with them. It is really hard to be out there dealing with different stressors, right? And if you have a child that is struggling, it's hard to be that parent that always has to manage that person. Um, and so really showing some of that genuine, you know, genuine feelings behind that, I think is huge. And, and with anything, um, the more that they get to know you, the better, right? Um, but I will tell you that one time I was at a funeral and I got sold out by the nuns at the funeral <laughs> as the FBI person. Um, and it was kind of a funny joke because they introduced me to somebody who I thought was really interested in the FBI. And it turned out to be somebody who really had a lot of conspiracies about the FBI um, that was at the church. And it was just a kind of an, an interesting dynamic, right? And, and so it's alive and well, uh, but, but I was genuine in my approach with that individual and helped challenge the preconceived notions that he had about the FBI. But all of us have that responsibility in our role. So I think what I'm hearing is something that every one of us, uh, regardless of which discipline, uh, which seat we're in uh, on this uh, symposium, that uh, by building relationships of trust personally, one-on-one, -on -one, I for one can say I would love to have Paul Dean sitting at the table with the rest of the group to, uh, to work a problem or to come up with strategies, strategies and solutions. And Carrie Gibson, uh, as well. It was Loretta Whitson who just spoke in our last segment um, about don't send a proxy. And I, I, that really resonated with me because that is true. When you build a relationship with one person, I don't know if I trust everyone at some particular um, uh, organization, but if I know that one, I, I, I think we've all heard this. Ah, geez, the police, oh, I'm a little bit intimidated. Oh, Paul, you're okay because I know you. That's a perfect example of uh, how trust is built, one relationship and uh, personality to personality, um, one at a time. So having the right person is what you said, Carrie. You wanna make sure the right person is speaking with the group, the right member of the FBI, the right uh, person of your team. And that one person fits all roles. It really, it sort of depends. But starting early on, when you do have your uh, crisis intervention team organizing, the time to call in the police when everything is going down the drain is not when it's going down the drain. That's not the time to start having someone in law enforcement catch up with uh, what the team is doing or what is needed to be done for that organization, that school, that company, for that crisis. 
So on the telephone, so we've had, as we do in our lines of work, don't we folks? There, there, there is a, oh, go ahead, Carrie, go ahead, please. Carrie, do you have something to add? The, um, in our line of work, we have the- Sorry, I'm stopping my- uh... Your video, sure, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I just stopped my video because of the connection, but I wanted to add to your point, um, those about people who trust other law enforcement officers that are there, that's huge. We use that a lot in how we build bridges with people. So if I know that a family has a, a person who they, they trust within the that law enforcement community, I will have them be a part of that introduction. I will have them be a part of that conversation. And that helps another way to kind of help them build that trust toward you. Precisely. And thank you for that, uh, Carrie. That is work that doesn't happen on the fly. It, it's evolutionary building trust with someone, not revolutionary. It doesn't happen in the snap of a finger. Uh, folks, I want to turn to uh, my colleague, uh, Eric Shen, and see if we can get um, uh, his input as well. I was just mentioning that the unexpected happens when you don't expect it. Is that right? Well, we were to have two presenters, Eric, Dr. Eric Plummer, uh, had a family emergency and could not join us. And also Eric Shen, but he's been able to join us by phone, even though he too is handling some personal matters, but is still serving our uh, our symposia. And um, Eric Shen is uh, the inspector in charge of criminal investigations for the United States Postal Service of the postal inspectors at, uh, at their headquarters in Washington. Uh, Eric, can you hear us okay? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, loud, loud and clear. Eric, thanks very much. I know that you're juggling multiple priorities, but your input here is valued and appreciated. And the thing I wanted to turn to the U.S. Postal Service, which has had a long history of having to manage workplace violence issues starting in the 1980s, probably prior to that, but certainly popularized, if you will, in the 1980s, is going from an organization that probably didn't have, did not have much experience or much of a plan to one that is well organized with respect to threat assessment. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about how the US Postal Service is approaching this now? Yeah, so, um, you know, with the Postal Service Act, as you know, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of employees. A lot of incidences that occur, you know, between employees and between employees and customers. Uh, what we do in the Postal Inspection Service with the Postal Service Management in every district in the country, we as inspectors have at least one person on a threat assessment team with postal management. They have monthly calls uh, to discuss either you know current situations with employees or potential situations. Uh, it, I think you know the the topic at hand: getting law enforcement, when to get law enforcement involved. We have that unique position of always being involved from the very beginning, and that's very helpful. Uh, obviously, some stuff falls through the cracks, but the sooner we get kind of knowledge of, of the individual uh, regarding threats, um, you know, and sometimes it'd be threat to themselves as far as, you know, inflicting harm on themselves as well. We can identify those things, work with our external partners like local law enforcement, other federal law enforcement partners on really dealing with the issue at hand. And, you know, a lot of times too, in discussion with postal management, we, we kind of recommend them on what they need to do because a lot of times it is administrative uh, avenues that they have to take and we, we kind of provide some of that guidance. You know, it's interesting. How many, do you know off the top of your head, how many districts are there across the United States for the Postal Service? You know, so I, you, I'm, ashamed know, I'm ashamed to say I do not know. Uh, well, as I said earlier, the, the questions were not, uh, you know, sent out in advance. But imagine, I'm just thinking for those of us who are tuned in and listening, to have that, I'm going to call it a luxury, but the foresight to establish crisis intervention teams, standing teams, not just ones that are dusted off and pulled into service when the crisis emerges, but have standing teams that have monthly meetings um, at every district for the U.S. Postal Service across the country. I know that most colleges and universities, and certainly we've heard from um, K through 12 secondary education, that this is a standard 
uh, in the more advanced and sort of perhaps the more fortunate uh, uh, school districts uh, to have crisis intervention, behavioral assessment uh, bit uh, teams that are multidisciplinary. And as I've seen in a number of these include at the very least the school resource officer, if not other members of law enforcement. Uh, but that's our, that's our emphasis here. Uh, Eric, thank you very much for, for that description of, of how you folks at the Postal Service are today in 2022 addressing what 20 years ago um, really caught a whole lot of us uh, flat footed. It's interesting how we turn to the vernacular of going postal and we talk about workplace violence, we talk about school violence, and uh, places like Columbine High School, when we would once think that the word Columbine meant a pretty wildflower, it becomes branded as something very sad and tragic. Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. And that's where uh, our work of including law enforcement um, is so critical. Carrie, I also want to um, talk with you about what are the resources that you might be able to list, at least a few, that law enforcement can provide. One of the things we talked about um, earlier on a separate phone call, uh, Chief Paul Dean and I, is that you know law enforcement can do an awful lot in understanding the background of an individual of concern. And furthermore, so many workplaces or even schools, once the threat is gone, the student is expelled, they've moved away, the employee is gone, whatever the case may be, too often we don't then notify, not that we have a duty to notify the next jurisdiction perhaps to where the individual concern has moved or gone to work, but be assured that if something goes bad at the next school, at the next workplace, questions will be asked, why didn't you tell us who we were hiring or admitting to our school? But Carrie, do you have any thoughts about how law enforcement can help uh, a, a crisis intervention or behavioral threat assessment team uh, better serve uh, their mission and perhaps better serve the community at large uh, with the farther reach that law enforcement can offer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not only do you have your, your local law enforcement entities that are within your, like, if you're at your college level or the, the city or, or state or federal, um, everybody has contacts and everybody has resources. And I think that um, you know, as we talked about yesterday, anytime you're trying to mitigate this risk, it's more of a process than an event. And so being able to have that forward thinking, obviously we resolve the immediate crisis, but we all have access to those resources or key things that work really well or different things, different hospitals that were extremely helpful. Um, and sometimes just being able to set it up the right way, like going to the right hospital or having the right doctor or, or having uh, the right communication be shared with that right person at the police department that they're in the area that they're moving to is important. And in the FBI, obviously, we have networks all over the United States and are able to do that. We also, I think, have a lot of uh, free tools, right? So we have trainings that we can come in and do from the FBI side of the house. We have handouts. We have, you know, more things than you'd ever want to know about targeted violence that we can give you to help augment what you already have. And so I think that a lot of times, again, it's those biases and stereotypes that the law enforcement just arrest people. And we have obviously evolved and changed from that to include other things in addition to that. So I think that uh, for sure from the FBI side, that's where we have the, the biggest plug for it. And we have, like I talked about yesterday, these uh, BAU coordinators, our behavioral analysis unit coordinators that are in every uh, 56 field offices out there and they all have them. And, and there's one specifically that we have given more training to that are called threat management coordinators. And they are your boots on the ground, ready to team up with you, ready to be that force multiplier. So please reach out to, to the FBI on those concerns. And especially when you have cases where there's ideology uh, attached to it, right? Domestic, um, you know, terrorism or international terrorism concerns, that's going to be very important as well. Thank you, Carrie. I want to encourage those who are tuned in and listening to not only, if you don't already have a good, trusting, uh, credible, close contact with your police, your primary jurisdiction, whether it's your city or town police department, it may be a county sheriff's department if you're working within a rural or rural jurisdiction or your state police, whoever your go-to person is, include them, embrace them, connect them with your behavioral assessment team, but also 
have that person connect your team, your group, with the resident agent uh, in charge for the FBI for your jurisdiction. There are 56 field offices in major cities across the United States. Each one, as Carrie Gibson has just told us, has a behavioral analysis unit a coordinator as a collateral duty, someone who's already connected with Quantico, Virginia at the FBI Academy Behavioral Analysis Unit. But have your local police who has those close contact and relation, professional relationships with the FBI for at least invite and include for a meeting or two, someone from the FBI in the unlikely, and hopefully unlikely event that you might need that resource uh, down the road uh, to, to do so. So, uh, Paul, I'm going to uh, switch back over to you. I want to uh, revisit mental health and law enforcement and our, I will often say law enforcement, I prefer saying police service. I'm the director of the Maine Community Policing Institute here at the University of Maine um, in Augusta. And one thing that we promote is the uh, co-produced public safety model of police service and mental health services joined at the hip, working together collaboratively to approach these issues, knowing that today police service is really a public health responsibility. When you look at it from the 10,000 foot view, and but having that vision shared isn't um, shared by, by everyone, um, at least not yet. But I know you're deeply vested, Paul, in mental health collaboration with law enforcement for the health safety and well-being of your community and others. Can you talk a little bit more about that for us? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's vital, and I want to go back to what Carrie said, to have that relationship with, with, uh, with several federal agencies. Um, I, I started the uh, campus liaison program with the FBI in 2007, then Special Agent Paul Brown, and then... Um, transitioned over to special agent in charge, uh, Cannon Ramsey, and who, who really took it and, and, and really pushed it hard throughout the New Hampshire colleges and universities. And that relationship has, has led to a, an immense amount of uh, support uh, to the university in, in a variety of different ways. So if, if you think that uh, the FBI is going to come in and like take over what you do. Uh, it's exactly the, the exact opposite. They provide support and resources and, and fit into where you are. So, so please, please do that. And if you need anything, reach out to me and I'll, I'm happy to, to share more with what we do. Right now, there, right now, law enforcement is kind of losing ground, Noel. And, and so there's a nationwide effort. It's called 988. And that, that nationwide effort is to transition mental health calls from 911 and sending them directly to the police to, to a 988 number, which is gonna be answered by mental health professionals who will then triage, triage those kind of calls. And we know that not everybody needs um, uh, serious intervention at that moment. They just maybe need resources and don't know where to go to there. But the model that is unrolling in, in New Hampshire uh, you will see it across the country, uh, LA has been doing it for a while, is to roll out a team to a mental health call of, of, uh, of mental health professionals uh, and social workers and uh, CIT trained uh, uh, police officers uh, to assess what's, what's going on uh, there. And that I think is the future of how we can properly manage together um, those, those incidents. You know, right now, I, you know, colleges and universities are actually really suited for this stuff. If you get an opportunity to speak to your, to your flagship school, to your state, they're suited for this in a lot of ways. They have on-campus mental health facilities and mental health counselors uh, that are there. They have, they have telemental health, you know, options. Um, my police officers, when they respond to a mental health call, have have telehealth, mental health counselors that they can get on the phone that can speak with the, the student that's in crisis, evaluate them for us, determine if they can build a safety plan where they can meet with the, with the campus um, psychologists and counselors the next day, or they need to go to the hospital for some more observation. Additionally, um, I've deployed uh, two um, 
comfort dogs, police officers who are certified and trained to deal with uh, crisis. And we have to stop looking at this from matters of the heart. You know, we, we, you know, society can be a strange thing and I'm probably not, um, I'm probably not gonna tell you anything you don't know, but depending on what's going on, the police be mold or evolve to it. So we were once uh, in the eighties, early nineties, the drug wars, the gangs more in the, in, in the warrior uh, kind of mode. Um, and the difficulty is, is that, you know, nobody tells us when to turn that off, right? And so, you know, we, we've now headed towards the guardian role and, and it's, about, it's about redirecting officers, old and new, uh, to matters of the heart, the reasons why they got into law enforcement. And we're seeing more people in crisis, Noel. I mean, the, the, you hit it on the head. The police are out 24-7, 365 days a year, okay? We, we are the ones that people need to go to. There's no... Um, response primarily after five o'clock to get a mental health professional to come to your house or and, unless you're part of one of these, you know, communities that have that 988 response. And so the police end up doing that. But like most other catch-all things the police are doing, when we respond to those things, many of our officers haven't had the CIT training, haven't had de-escalation training. And so, and so we're doing that. We're doing the work in our in, in our areas to be better first responders uh, when it comes to that. But law enforcement has to engage those in the different sectors that support mental health by going there and listening. If there's a relationship that needs to be mended, you've got to sit and listen and let those people tell their truth to you. And then work to ways to work around that and show them what a partnership truly looks like. I, I live the success of that at the University of New Hampshire. And, and I'm, I, am, I, I am blessed with the response that we have and I know we've saved people. What I do at my college, what many of my colleagues in IACLEA at colleges across the country do can be emulated. I encourage you to speak to them. I've, I have worked with many K through 12, many businesses to institute the same models there. And it's worked. We have to get involved early so that we can avoid the incidents, Noel. That's good, Paul. Thank you, because what you've just shared, your perspective, your perception is, is really, of course, heartfelt, but it's, it's not unique to the men and women in the police profession in this country. You know, there's um, nearly 19,000 police departments, just municipal police departments in this country. Um, but also uh, 680, 700,000 police officers and virt I've interviewed hundreds of them, as of you, Paul. Uh, virtually every one of them will answer these two responses to this question. The question is, why do you want to be a police officer? And you guys can probably figure out with at least one, if not both. And it's the answers are because I want to help people and I want to make a difference. And I fully believe, I've been doing this as long as Paul Dean has, that that is absolutely the sincere answer for this calling. Certainly, we're recruiting from the human race. And as a result, we are apt to hire humans. And we fail at that on occasion. And some of us don't belong in this profession. But by and large, they're, they're helpers, not unlike mental health, not unlike education, not unlike the medical community and the other human service professions. And picking the right person, that comes either up to the, to the chief or to the uh, crisis intervention group asking for someone in particular. Quite often the school resource officer is that person because that relationship of credibility and trust has been and communication has been established in advance. So having the right person with the right heart and the right head for this is absolutely critical as it is for every other person that fills every other seat in a behavioral assessment, threat assessment uh, team. Now, um, I want to uh, uh, re-invite Eric uh, Shane to uh, join us one more time. Eric, can you hear us still? Yes, sir. All right, great. Hey, Eric, you know, in the Postal Service, you know, it's, we're, we're very interested in that. 
um, as well as when we look at different examples of what we've learned, what we've learned over the course of time of what, what works and what doesn't work. And off the top of your head, are you able to share from your own experiences, because you've investigated a number of threats, I mean, where are we seeing the more successful outcomes when we're working with workplace uh, uh, employees? Is it um, uh, working with a dissatisfied customer case, uh, the bomb threats, domestic violence? What is it that uh, your crisis intervention teams seem to have the most impact, the most success um, with uh, working with them? What cases? You know, generally, I think, you know, the topic at hand, you know, being involved at the very beginning, you identify some of those issues uh, early on. So I think the successful ones where are we have employees that might be um, more apt to potentially do physical harm than just not just, you know, actually carrying out their verbal threats, uh, identifying those early and removing them from the work environment, and then even providing, you know, giving them options of if they need to seek help, we give them that kind of options. I think those are the successes uh, that we can kind of speak on generally uh, when we are involved with these uh, threats and assaults uh, throughout the country. Um, you know, working with postal management, coming up with a plan to to really, you know, um, diffuse the situation to make sure that the employee uh, is removed from harming anyone, including themselves. I think those are probably the best ones. It sounds like that sort of an organizational philosophy is what is embraced, I think, by most forward thinking and enlightened uh, workplaces. Uh, mental health first aid is um, an educational program that is taught to many law enforcement uh, police officers uh, as it is in others in the HR world and in employee assistance and the like. But um, I'm curious, uh, do you have training around crisis intervention um, and, uh, and mental health response, whether it's uh, CIT or um, mental health first aid that postal inspectors uh, are provided? Uh, well, we, we get a general uh, training you know, when we first, of course, in the academy, coming out of the academy, we do some post training for our inspectors that respond to these threats and assaults. Um, but they, they're not really certified in it, it and, and can are certified professionals, uh, but they, they know what resources to, to kind of tap into uh, when they do see it. So they can, they have the general knowledge of it where they can identify it. And that's when we really lean on and work with local law enforcement, other law enforcement entities um, to, to kind of come up with that plan on, on what, to, what the next steps are. Um, and, you know, that's something that's continually evolved. We have to evolve with, with, you know, the times. So we are doing more and more training now, uh, especially uh, coming up. We're actually going to train with the postal management uh, people that they work with on these threat assessment teams. Um, and that's not something that we've done in the past. Normally, you know, it's, Postal inspectors would, would do training on our own uh, within, and then postal management would do training on their own from within, mm -hmm. and then we kind of talk and discuss and go forward from there. So this is kind of a, a, a more efficient concept of training our folks together so they can then be able to, you know, they work together all the time and they discuss, so they'll, they'll have a better knowledge and better chemistry to really be able to solve some issues at hand or if something pops up that they they know already kind of what the next steps are. Well, yes, that's part of the evolutionary uh, growth that we've been talking about a little bit. And then, listen, I think everyone will appreciate that training together helps build trust and collaboration and build relationship. And that makes for a stronger team. Eric, can I presume that uh, an organization the size of the U.S. Postal Service that those who are involved with the uh, threat assessment and these teams that we've been speaking about have access to a professional uh, psychologist and legal guidance as well as to how to proceed 
and what would be the best courses of action under the circumstances. Do you have those kinds of resources available to your uh, crisis intervention teams or your threat assessment teams? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's local counsel from the postal side and from the inspection service side when it comes to these type of situations. Uh, we also, you know, we provide, uh, you know, we always offer uh, employee assistance uh, programs, what we call EAP, for anyone who, who has that um, that need to talk to somebody. And it's, and, and it's very confidential. So we always offer that to people that have been in situations where we might potentially see some patterns of mental health issues uh, or just, you know, we're, we're, li we're living through a, a pandemic. That was a really tough time for our agency as a whole on the Postal Service. Still continue to deliver mail. We were counted on to continue our business. And during that time, it you know, we're still doing our jobs, yet you still have to come home and deal with the pandemic of if you have kids, they're out of school, uh, you know, a spouse who may be out of work, something to that effect. So we really wanted to offer that additional help or just remind people that there are um, resources they can go to. Sure enough. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, Neil, I want to invite in uh, one of our uh, viewers, Matthew Kalkali, um, who posed a question. And, and I'd love to talk about uh, your question, Matthew. Is that something that um, you're willing to uh, unmute and, uh, and pose to the, to the panel? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I know, Chief Dean, you spoke about this um, a little bit earlier about how law enforcement should be involved um, early on in the process of a case. So I just wanted to um, pose a question to everybody here about uh, is there a national threshold of when law enforcement should be involved or is it is it kind of just contextual? Uh, thank you. Well, I, let me let me jump in real quick, um, Paul. Just this is on the tip of my tongue. Just my own personal experience of being that law enforcement leader at that table uh, when I once held the role of police chief for the University of Maine um, here, and that is this. Um, it's kind of like sitting around the Knights of the Round Table where everyone has their superpower. That's sort of how it's described for me once. And involving law enforcement, uh, Matthew, can mean so many things. For example, we had a particular case of an individual of concern, and my role as the police chief was not to enforce the law, but my role is to go find next of kin. We need to find some family members to get involved with wrapping our arms around this intervention. And I had the resources to do some background checking to see who might be a family member that would be willing to assist with this person that was... Um, um, had an emotional disturbance issue that was causing concern on our campus. So my police role, so involving the threshold was day one, was minute one, because we all had our roles and responsibilities around uh, addressing that particular issue of concern. But I will flip over to Paul Dean now to offer his perspective on your question. Thanks, Noel. You know, the, there, there is no national standard, but there are national best practices. And the best practices will tell you to include um, law enforcement, public safety in the formation of your care teams, behavioral intervention teams, whatever you, you want to, to call them. Um, if they're not included, you know, that's, that's a red flag as to why. And, and, and there should be some work that's, that's done uh, there because as, as those in law enforcement know, when, you know, when you're a street officer and you respond to a, a call in a, an apartment building for an issue, you don't get called when the issue stops. You get called when the issue's in the 11th hour and it can't be solved and you're walking in there and you're trying to figure out maybe days, weeks, or months of conflict between people and try to make a quick assessment. And, you know, Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't because you don't have all the information that you need. And so when it comes to when it comes to issues of students of concern, employees of concern, you know, you you need to be at the ground floor because I have never sat in a behavioral intervention team meeting, which I every every week at 9 a.m. 
where an individual of concern didn't have more than one touch point with a representative at that table, whether it be the police, whether it be housing, whether it be residential life, whether it be the library, at some place, dining services, you know, people, you know, people don't just snap. And so you, you, you identify seepage all over uh, the place. Ha being a part of that uh, team from the very start allows you to have a global perspective on what's going on with that, with that person. And then, you know, go speak with others to get a full picture of that. Because this is all about helping people. You know, I, getting early intervention has been the key at the University of New Hampshire. Those students get help and they come back and they're productive members of our society and graduate. You know, they just, they just need help. And more and more students, especially over this last two years, young people are really struggling hard with the isolation. They're struggling hard with Zoom. You know, we're all here on Zoom. We'd love for us to meet in person. That's usually a better conversation, but their whole days are stuck in a room on Zoom. Um, and, you know, that's had an impact on them and their socialization. And, and so having that ground floor and not being called in when somebody says, geez, this is getting serious, let's call the police, makes it a heck of a lot easier for us to, to do that. So I encourage everyone if they're not part of a behavior intervention team or they know of one and it doesn't have a representation from law enforcement, that you ask that question why and, 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 try, to, and try to make that happen or at least make a presentation to the team as to why it's important for you to be involved. I think most uh, members of these uh, interdisciplinary teams will find that the law enforcement of their jurisdiction has uh, the leader or the key person that would be part of their team has the same amount of thoughtful compassion and insight as Paul Dean does. And so many people just don't have a, a relationship with their police that they have an appreciation for that. So I just want to emphasize it as well as Anthony Kramer's viewing uh, just gave us a well said, uh, Paul. So you got a thumbs up um, there as does uh, Star Butterton is also validating and affirming your, your comments. Carrie, I want to pop over to you as well with Matthew's question to give your um, perspective as well, because uh, what we know is that when does law, is there a threshold, is there a tipping point when law enforcement should be involved? Well, that's interesting because law enforcement is different things and different levels and different specialties. And your local police are one level of law enforcement too sort of cross that threshold, which we're all advocating is day one, right from the beginning, be part of it from the start. But secondly, uh, when would it be appropriate for the FBI to be consulted? Uh, and in what sorts of cases might uh, that be beneficial earlier rather than later? Carrie? Yeah, thanks, Noel. I, you know, I think that, I mean, I agree with everything that what Chief Dean said. And, and I think that in the past, we've had... Uh, very kind of, uh, I think people, you know, there's very clear, you know, reasons why you call police and it's very black and white. And now it's not so black and white anymore, given the threat that we have to our community. And I, I just think it's very important to think about it in a way like obviously for the FBI side of the house, we, we investigate federal crimes. Um, we, so that's pretty broad based, right? And um, we also obviously focus on any type, there's an ideology involved we have a mission to prevent acts of targeted violence. Um, law enforcement have a need to know when there's concerns in their community, they have the right to know as soon as possible that there's a threat to their community or a potential threat to their community. So they can be proactive in getting involved to help mitigate that. The sooner that law enforcement get involved, the sooner things can, can be mitigated uh, in a way that's maybe non-traditional from a law enforcement perspective. And I think that that's huge. If we wait until someone's bringing a gun into the parking lot to shoot up a school to call law enforcement, well, that's only going to end one way. We only have one tool to use for that. But if we start sooner in the process, we have way more tools to do that. Um, and I'll tell you, I was involved in a training one time at, at a college campus, and it was a specific threat assessment training to, to people. And I was listening to uh, one of the lawyers present, and they were obviously presenting on their data privacy and different things like that, that they want everyone to know about. 
but somebody from the the audience asked a question and, and talked about a specific case and said when you know i don't know what to do with this case and it went through a fact pattern that was concerning and that that lawyer gave her a list of people that she could call and number seven was the law enforcement and and that's just not okay right um law enforcement should be number one when you're concerned for for something bad to happen and even if it's not going to happen today something bad law enforcement are best suited to be able to proactively address that in a way that could be helpful to the person. That's great, uh, Carrie, thank you. And thank you for your comment, uh, Patricia, and your, uh, your accolade and mahalos to uh, law enforcement. It's very much uh, appreciated. So uh, Brett, I think that uh, the time has come when we may want to toggle back over for some closing uh, thoughts and um, I'll, uh, I'll turn the, uh, the floor to you, ma'am. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Noel, Chief Dean, uh, Carrie, and Eric for uh, your comments and for your insights. And I want to thank the audience for continuing to be so engaged over the course of this symposium. As Chief Dean mentioned, this would all be better if we could be in person and I'm here to tell you that's what we're doing next. So uh, please, please stay tuned. Uh, we will be reaching out to everyone who registered for this event to invite you to our summer symposium. Our summer symposium will take place in person in Los Angeles, California in late July. We'll reach out with a save the date shortly. And if you have speaker ideas for the topic of prevention through education, we welcome those from you as well. Um, so please keep an, your eye out for an, save the date and ultimately register for that in-person symposium in July this in Los Angeles. I also wanna give a final reminder to all of you, if you haven't filled out our survey yet uh, over the last two weeks, please do so now. Neil just populated it in the chat. This allows us to get your input on what types of programs would be most effective and get your input on what you need most from this network and whether the resources we're producing thus far are meeting those needs. So please uh, fill out that survey if you haven't done so already. Um, I want everyone to join me again in thanking all of our speakers over the course of two days. We've had phenomenal content really at all stages of integrating assessment and management at the federal level from the National Threat Assessment Center and the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit in schools in conversations yesterday and today in the workplace with Eric's comments from the Postal Investigative Service. And how do we address adjust our language over time to make these uh, assessment and management processes as welcoming uh, across sectors and disciplines as possible. I also wanna give a final thanks out to the Canadian Practitioners Network for co-hosting our workshop this morning. And finally, to the Institute for Strategic Dialogue for preparing our phenomenal read ahead materials they will be all, also be producing a practice guide uh, with lessons from the symposium. If you haven't had a chance to meet him yet, Neil Saul is our new administrator for this network. He's going to populate the practitioners network at mccaininstitute.org email address in the chat. If you have any questions or ideas for him, please drop him a line and we look forward to seeing you in person in Los Angeles this summer. Thank you again, everyone.